Hello, good morning. My name is Jonathan King. Thank you for uh, joining us for this webinar. Uh, in a point of introduction, I am Assistant Professor of Surgery uh, here at UCLA uh, in the Aggie Hirschberg Center for Pancreatic Diseases. And uh, today we're going to speak about uh, robotic pancreatic surgery. I'd like to remind uh, viewers to, uh, if you have any questions through the uh, presentation, uh, submit your questions via uh, Twitter at this hashtag uh, or via Facebook. And uh, we will have a Q&A following the presentation. So the most common questions I get are robotic surgery. What exactly is it? Um, is this a robot that's operating on me? And the short answer is no. Uh, the robot has no autonomy. Uh, and actually, it's the surgeon sitting at the console uh, that controls every movement of, of the robotic arms. Uh, the advantage comes from actually the computer uh, within the robot that actually scales uh, my movements as, as I'm moving at the console and uh, allows a very high degree of precision, uh, as well as the visualization we get from uh, the camera, which is a stereoscopic camera. So unlike regular laparoscopy, we have a 3D view of, of everything that's happening. Uh, and then also an advantage over standard laparoscopy is the dexterity that we get from the instruments, uh, which function just like a human wrist, where all the possible motions that include bending, uh, grasping, and uh, uh, turning are, are possible. So I draw an analogy uh, that using the robotic uh, platform for surgery is akin to a pilot uh, operating a fighter jet uh, in that the computer basically scales the moments and, and acts as a, a control uh, to make more precision uh, and finer motions. And it allows us to perform more complex surgery than is possible with standard laparoscopy. So on the left hand side you see a, a diagram of the typical incision for a standard classical Whipple uh, that is performed in the open manner. Uh, whereas when we do robotic surgery, we use small incisions and these robotic arms to uh, achieve the same operation, uh, but again, minimally invasively. Where the largest incision uh, down on the left lower abdomen is only three centimeters, which is just a little bit over an inch. And this, as you can imagine, allows for more rapid recovery, uh, which translates to a shorter hospitalization. Uh, and when necessary, a shorter lag time to chemotherapy is, is potentially possible. There's less blood loss typically, and importantly, the outcomes in terms of the quality of the operation are not compromised. And by quality, I mean oncologic outcomes such as getting the whole tumor out, meaning a margin negative tumor removal. Uh, as well as uh, sampling of adequate number of lymph nodes. So these are things that we do not have to sacrifice in order to take a minimally invasive approach. And it's important uh, that we achieve the same goals uh, with the operation. There are similar complication rates, and of course there are small incisions. So here I have a video actually of a model that we are doing in a lab of the exact part of the uh, Whipple operation. So this is a, a simulated tissue uh, and uh, using the robotic instruments, which you can see them in action here, uh, we, we make a new connection between two pieces of simulated intestine. So here you can see we're sewing and, and those wrists allow us to have very fine control of the instruments. And we can do all the same steps that we would do in the normal open operation but again, minimally invasively. So part of the reason why we don't have laparoscopic or minimally invasive approaches to pancreatic surgery uh, the way we do for gallbladder surgery or some of the other common uh, operative procedures is the complexity of pancreatic surgery. So to begin with, the pancreas is in a, a protected location. Uh, here seen with the stomach actually uh, flipped up, the pancreas is actually behind the stomach and some of these other organs. And when we talk about the pancreas and when we talk about operations for the pancreas, it's also important to understand that there are different regions of the pancreas and the operation uh, for pathology in different regions of the pancreas changes. So there's the head, a neck and body, as well as a tail. 
And so when there's a tumor, for instance, in the head of the pancreas, then what is necessary is what's called a Whipple operation, and that's this diagram down here. Uh, this is about as complicated as GI surgeries get uh, in that we have to take out part of the pancreas, the head of the pancreas, part of the small intestine called the duodenum, as well as the gallbladder and part of the bile duct. And that means that we have to make new connections uh, to all of these structures, and that's what's on the bottom right. Uh, where uh, we've sewn together a piece of intestine to, to let all of these structures uh, drain so that people can eat and, and digest their foods normally. Now, in the tail of the gland, uh, if we need to remove the tail of the gland, it's, it's a lot simpler because we don't have to make all those new connections. Uh, and we call that a distal pancreatectomy. And depending on the reason for the surgery, we will uh, sometimes take the spleen as well. A central pancreatectomy involves taking out part of the body, and rarely we perform a total pancreatectomy or removal of the whole pancreas. And there are also drainage operations uh, for chronic pancreatitis that we won't talk about much here, but are also, all of these operations are possible uh, with the robotic assistance uh, in a laparoscopic or minimally invasive fashion. What conditions are treated? Well, pancreas cancer would be the most common, uh, and certainly uh, this is one of the main indications uh, for uh, doing uh, these types of surgeries. Um, and there's also a variant of pancreas cancer called neuroendocrine tumors, uh, which we abbreviate PNETs. Uh, cystic uh, tumors of the pancreas, which uh, behave sometimes like polyps in the colon, uh, in terms of they can be pre-malignant. Uh, and these are called intraductal papillary mucinous neoplasms, or IPMN, uh, as well as uh, mucinous cystic lesions sometimes are, again, reasons for uh, performing pancreatic surgery. And chronic pancreatitis is another uh, reason. And again, all of these uh, diseases are treated with a uh, robotic-assisted approach. So what are the, some of the signs and symptoms of pancreatic disease? Now, this isn't specific just to pancreatic cancer, but uh, certainly uh, these are warning signs of, of malignant diseases like pancreatic cancer. Uh, the number one is, is jaundice, which is yellowing of the skin or eyes uh, and uh, darkening of the urine. Uh, weight loss can certainly be common, uh, as can be a specific type of uh, loose stools called steatorrhea, which signifies fats in the uh, stool. New or worsening diabetes can be a, a very common uh, presenting sign, although it's subtle, and, and most people who have new onset diabetes do not have pancreatic cancer. Uh, and abdominal and back pain. So once you've been referred uh, to a surgeon or to uh, the Center for Pancreatic Diseases here at UCLA, uh, you're evaluated by a team of physicians. So uh, on this team are uh, surgeons such as myself, uh, there are gastroenterologists, medical oncologists, radiologists, pathologists, and we meet every Tuesday and discuss all of the clinical uh, information uh, that comes to us and form a treatment plan. And then we see you in clinic uh, also as a team, uh, such that you see all the necessary specialties to treat your specific condition. Following this evaluation, we may order additional laboratory studies. Uh, additional imaging, such as a CAT scan or a computed tomography or MRI. Uh, endoscopy is sometimes necessary, uh, and this will uh, oftentimes in include an endoscopic ultrasound, which is a way of performing ultrasound from inside. Uh, and this is, uh, allows us to perform biopsies often as well. And then oftentimes a preoperative medical checkup uh, to uh, address any cardiac, pulmonary, uh, or other medical problems that, that exist. Uh, an important aspect of getting ready for a surgery uh, is nutrition, uh, as well as maintaining an active lifestyle. So I always in, include uh, a bit of information about uh, being sure to eat healthily and also to uh, maintain your activity levels leading up to a, a big surgery. What can you expect from one of these robotic-assisted uh, operations. Well, I'll focus here on the Whipple, uh, but uh, when we finish surgery, we uh, do leave a single drainage tube, which is a thin, uh, about the diameter of a pencil, uh, drainage tube that's flexible and is connected to a, a drainage bulb. And that stays from anywhere between uh, three 
to sometimes uh, five to seven days. Most patients are discharged without their drain, although occasionally some people do go home with their drain. Uh, we do plan to have you out of bed walking on the first day after surgery, and most people are able to have a clear liquid diet on the first day of after surgery, which is advanced to a solid diet, usually within two to three days. Hospital stays average about four to seven days, with most ending up in the five to six day range. And home recovery is an important part of, of the recovery and, and it can last up to four to six weeks. So I would like to talk to about a couple of case vignettes. These are actual patients that um, we've de-identified obviously. Um, but the first is a, a relatively young gentleman that presented actually with an obstruction of his colon. Uh, and the CAT scan here uh, shows that there's a tumor in the tail of the pancreas. And this has caused that obstruction uh, in the colon. So our endoscopy colleagues were able to place a stent uh, to open up the colon. Uh, and that allowed us then to come back and, and do a distal pancreatectomy, a removal of the spleen, or excuse me, a removal of the tail of the gland along with the spleen and this piece of colon that was involved in the tumor. Uh, and we made a new connection and uh, achieved a margin negative resection, meaning all the edges were clear of tumor. Uh, and the patient went home on post-operative day six and was able to begin chemotherapy uh, one month after surgery. And another patient who had chronic pancreatitis and debilitating abdominal pain, uh, there was a stone in her pancreatic duct uh, that was causing a blockage that was attempted to be dealt with endoscopically uh, but uh, was not possible. And so uh, we performed a uh, robotic-assisted Whipple uh, she went home on her fourth uh, post-operative day and uh, at this point no longer requires any pain medications. So, and here she is uh, doing well and happy. So with that, I would like to uh, again uh, address some uh, questions uh, from the audience. So our first question here is uh, why can't surgeons remove just the pancreas tumor and leave the neighboring organs in place? Well, certainly in the case of uh, taking out the tail of the gland, what we call a distal pancreatectomy, oftentimes we will just take out the pancreas. Uh, the problem is the complexity of the anatomy in the head of the gland. Uh, I didn't mention it, but there's numerous blood vessels and the blood supply actually to the pancreas and the first part of the intestine uh, mandates that when we take out that head of the pancreas, we also have to take out these other structures, the bile duct and the intestine, uh, and then make new connections. And again, this is part of the reason why it's been so slow to develop uh, minimally invasive uh, techniques and really does uh, benefit from a robotic-assisted approach. So uh, another question here is, uh, what is the best thing I can do to prevent pancreas cancer? Well. Uh, it's also a common question, and uh, it's a little bit harder to answer. So uh, in most cases, we don't know exactly what caused uh, a, any individual's pancreas cancer. Now, there are uh, rare individuals who uh, have a genetic predisposition. Their family has a lot of uh, pancreatic cancer, and, and there are some specific gene mu mutations that we know of. Uh, but unfortunately, these are rare. Uh, and so, again, in most cases, we don't know uh, what caused anybody's pancreas cancer, but we can say that smoking is the most common identifiable risk factor uh, for uh, some patients. Uh, and so quitting smoking uh, is always good advice and, and um, it's never too late uh, um, to uh, go ahead and, and quit smoking and, and that uh, presumably reduces the risk. Uh, but in most cases, unfortunately, we don't have a good idea. Uh, another uh, question I have is, uh, are there times when robotic assisted surgery is not an option for pancreatic disease? So certainly yes. Uh, we uh, tend not to operate with uh, robotic assistance or minimally invasively on uh, patients who have uh, pancreatic tumors, for instance, that involve uh, some of the big blood vessels that, that run through the head of the pancreas, for instance. Uh, in these cases, when we suspect that the blood vessel may be involved, uh, or that we may require a, um, a reconstruction of that blood vessel, uh, then we routinely approach that uh, with an open approach. Uh, but pretty much uh, most other uh, indications uh, are able to be addressed in a minimally invasive fashion. Ultimately, it, it requires being evaluated by myself uh, uh, and the uh, pancreatic center to, to determine what the best approach uh, for you would be. 
And uh, another question, how does robotic assisted surgery uh, impact complication rates? Well, it's a very good question and, and it's a bit of an unknown. So uh, robotic assisted uh, pancreatic surgery uh, has only been done uh, on the order of about uh, eight or nine years. Um, and so we're still collecting data in terms of uh, what the, the absolute differences are. What I can say is that uh, all the data indicates, as I mentioned before, that the complication rates are similar or even better um, in terms of blood loss and uh, uh, some of the other common uh, complications from uh, you know, pancreas uh, resections. Uh, and so it's certainly safe uh, and it may offer some, some benefits in terms of the quicker recovery and uh, we think maybe a, a quicker time to um, being ready for chemotherapy. And uh, this one, why is pancreas surgery usually so extensive and complicated? Um, we did address this uh, a little bit early in the presentation uh, in terms of um, the protected location of the pancreas. It's you know, behind other organs um, and then also uh, the necessity to make these new connections between the intestine, the pancreas, the bile duct, uh, and the uh, stomach. Uh, and so really that is, that is a lot of what uh, makes it uh, complicated. I think with that, uh, we'll wrap it up and um, thank you for joining me and uh, I hope this was helpful.